session on translocating Indian writings. This coming in carrying our native language literatures to other parts of the country as well as to other parts of the world. One of the issues that came up for discussion was that process of relocating our native languages elsewhere calls for very good translations. In this session, we will focus on some aspects of that, particularly relating to the skills and the languages which are required to the translation. Helping me out in this panel are very three senior regional writers, many accomplished translators themselves, major writers. We have in both about the car, a very senior and major Bengali poet who has 27 books of poetry publication, who has traveled all over the world reading his books, was editor of Bahit Academy of Indian Literature, and now he edits Bhashyanagar, a person of substantial achievement. In Dr. Saxena, we have a very major Hindi scholar, a poet, and her poetry we heard yesterday even at the Raj Bhavan, Subodh of Subodh. Incidentally, Subodh is the Sahit Academy winner of 2013. Who is Sati Saxena? She won the Sahit Academy Award earlier. She is the editor of Kritya, and yet another poet who has represented India in several international Krishna. And then in Professor Ramakrishnan, we have a very major Malayalam writer. He not only writes in Malayalam, but he also writes in English. He translates from several languages. He translates from Marathi, Gujarati, Hindi, and English into and away from Malayalam. So we have a panel which is very, uh, very strong with their writing as well as translation. And they'll be helping us look at the particular theme that we have chosen for this session, which is, is bilingualism vanishing or diminishing in this country? And bilingualism is essential for any good translation. My first question to you, Professor Ramakrishna, is Earlier, as as, uh, as the person introducing us was mentioning, sometime back we had very senior national leaders who were very proficient in multiple languages and wrote and did the translation. But that trend seems to have come down now. Even though we see an increased activity of translation is that pretty compared to, let's say, 10 years ago. Still, there is a very serious dearth of good translators. Why do you think the situation has arisen? Uh, thank you, Mr. Rao. In fact, uh, sometime back, uh, historian Ramachandra Guha uh, wrote an article about the decline of bilingualism in India. In a way, he was uh, relating it to the decline of dialogue itself uh, among intellectuals in India. If you look at uh, the period of national freedom struggle, there was active kind of bilingualism. All major writers were talking to the people in their own speech community, also at a pan-Indian level. Gandhi was the president of Gujarat Sahitya Academy. He was an active writer in Gujarati. Uh, this you can, you can actually find across India a whole lot of such bilingual intellectuals. The point I would like to make is a language has a certain level of interiority. To be actively bilingual would mean not merely being functional in two languages, but being in a way entering into that very interior space where you have command of several registers, several uh, semiotic systems within language and this also requires an extended kind of 
preoccupation with language. You would see someone who translates Marquez does only Marquez translation because it uh, requires tremendous investment of time and uh, uh, cultivation of knowledge. If you want to translate somebody like Tagade Shivashankara Pillai from Kerala, you should know a whole lot of sociology. There should be a whole lot of uh, other material, sociological, political, etc. that I will come to later. So this level of interiority is something which now is diminishing. People have functional kind of, they are very fluent uh, in their own, in English, and they have working knowledge in several Indian languages, but this level of interiority, this ability to penetrate into experiential levels within a, a particular language requires a, a kind of uh, engagement with uh, uh, imaginative literature, history, sociology, etc., which I find is not really happening. And that is, I, there is bilingualism, but not the active, creative kind of bilingualism, which perhaps is required in this uh, country. I, I, I agree with you, Mr. Hmm. Uh, yet another dimension to this issue is that English uh, is very widely spoken uh, in this country and is also uh, a highly preferred medium of education in our schools. Most of the parents would want the children to go to medium, uh, sorry, English medium school. This has led to a situation where uh, perhaps the focus on some of the other regional languages of the mother tongue. Do you think focus on English uh, uh, has uh, <coughs> skewed uh, the language skills in other uh, uh, languages? <coughs> Good morning. Um, at the very beginning, I want to make a clear statement because you know this bilingualism is a is a is a, is a huge term in India. And uh, the first part is translating India. This is very really important for me. So Bengal was so insular from the very beginning that it never considered translating India was very important. They thought, including Tagore, they thought that translating Europe would be more important for the Bengali leadership. And this is how they became insular to I mean, the other languages of India. And uh, when I grew up, there was no Pukaram for me. So I have been translating uh, for the last 25 years. And I have been editing a magazine, uh, as Rao has already pointed out. It's a Bhashana, but it's a bilingual magazine we have. And we have being translating, I, I have been trying my best to engage my friends, poet friends, translators, to translate from Indian languages. Even I didn't mind if you do it with, through English. But you know, very few professional translators we have, translating from um, Malayalam into Bengali, uh, from Marathi into Bengali, from um, uh, any other, from Hindi into Bengali, very few. We have a class of translators in India. It's like in Hindi, for example, Hindi, you know, uh, Maharshita Devi has been hugely translated into Hindi and into other Indian languages. It's not a both way traffic for Bengal. It's that we are translating you and you are translating us. That's, that's the most, uh, what should I say, that would be the most uh, beautiful situation we all hope for, that Indian writers would be translating Indian writers. But we have, uh, so many versions of translations of Baudelaire and Rilke and Marquez and uh, Rabatu Bolano till date. But we don't have young writers from Hindi, we don't have young writers from Tamil, we don't have young writers uh, from uh, Kerala in Bengali translations. That is uh, the most difficult situation uh, that I have been facing for the last 25 years. And, uh, I think that uh, it is, as already have pointed out, that uh, that they have the Bengalis are more into Europe, more into American literature, more into Latin American literature 
but not that much into Indian literature. That is the most uh, pathetic part of the translation business, which is gaining strength every day in India. Because now we have a lot of prizes for translation. We, we, we are giving so much of importance to translation. But this is an absolutely different situation in Bengal. But I believe that as we have started some magazines, like Bhashanagar has already I have pointed out, there are some other followers. And so I believe that we are going to have uh, so, uh, going to break the ions. It's, it's very difficult. You know, for example, that uh, English writing from India, you do not need any translation. It's OK. It comes to Calcutta from different parts, from Bombay, from uh, Goa, from uh, Delhi, from Bangalore. There is no problem. But what about E.V. Ramakrishnan? How does it travel? How does this work? travel out to when he writes in his own uh, language. How does it travel out to ben Bengal? So we wanted to have this, this, this one India as it was imagined by the by Amir Chakra, Secretary to Tagore. So, so as uh, way back in the 30s, he said, Akhondo Bharati Manush, this one Indian mind. I think this one Indian mind which Tagore imagined at Vishwa Bharati. It was great that he, that he invited everybody from India and also from Europe to Shanti together. But that one Indian mind, that is, that is now, I think that I have a lot of doubts about one Indian mind. I think one of the important points that he has made is it would be very ideal if you are able to translate directly from Bengali to Malayalam or Malayalam to, uh, you know, uh, let us say, Konkan. But this basically requires a very high skill in these two languages, Bengali and let us say Malayalam. And uh, finding persons with this kind of a very high level skills in two native Indian languages, two regional languages, is much more difficult than finding people with skills in one, one original language and English. So what has been happening is a lot of our original literature are being translated into English, and then they get translated from English to the other languages. That's how I think the literature of one region is reaching, <coughs> reaching all the other regions. Uh, of course, what, what you say to both is- But this is the translation of the translation. Yeah, exactly. If it goes via English, you are translating the translation. I, 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 I not the, not the original text. I fully agree with him. What he's saying is, in uh, a retranslation, uh, some quality or effectiveness of the translation would be gone. But I think that is, I mean, you'll find a lot more translated who can translate from the original language into English or vice versa than, let us say, from a big body to the other. But, but we do have some that people. And as I admitted, that will be an ideal condition. But as we should have that. Strategies. Uh, when I was talking to you, because we have translated from Malayalam to English, uh, you were mentioning that very high skills in the source as well as uh, the language into which it has been translated may not be an essential factor. Would you like to elaborate on that? With your permission, first I want to remark on his one thing that what he says that, as you said, that the translation does not need only the language, it needs the culture knowledge of culture, knowledge of geography, knowledge of everything. So, for example, I get the he mentioned the Tagari, and I was translating Tagari's Kaya epic form for MVP. And I have, uh, because you know that that the Tagadi has bought 100 years uh, uh, Malayalam uh, Nayar family's culture in that. And there you know that Sambandha is something which is not marriage, which is not engagement. And uh, when I talked to that time, Ayapa Padikar was helping me, and he said that you write Sambandha and you keep the note at the end. I have done like this. But what happened when the book has reached to NBT, an editor has removed the sambandha and he has done it sagai. Sagai means engagement. And it is both things are very, very different and without my knowledge they have done. So many things 
they have done like that at Kuduva um, Parate. Means that is the marriage was like this, giving the cloth. And it is just like the, we said, Tere Hato uh, uh, Me Mehdi Rasha Do. Or Tere Ghar Doli Liya. It is like a phrase there. So, but what he said that uh, Mangal Sadi Leya. Uh, a Mangal Sadi was not, I have not written Mangal Sadi, but at, because at that time, uh, the Kerala people were not wearing sari at all. So one thing. Second thing, as Subo says that I, I will tell him that I read uh, Rabindra Tagore and Sharachan before Prejja in Hindi. We were fan of. So this is really pity that why didn't you read Prejja? It is really sad thing. So now I talk about me and my uh, my situation. As I said that, that uh, because I live in Kerala, I study. I learned, I talked to great poets, I, uh, uh, I was very, very friendly to uh, the poets, writers and artists there. So I could understand the culture and then that I feel that language, I know Malayalam uh, comfortably, I can speak also, I can read also, but I am not, I cannot write a poetry in Malayalam, so I am not very much skilled in writing Malayalam, but I feel that my translation would be little bit better than the person who knows two languages but do not know the culture, do not know the history, do not know the base. So that is, I feel that because if you know the source language uh, little bit, uh, discomfortably, and you can communicate with the poet or writer or you can communicate to the writer through some scholar or some poet or a, then it is easy and if you are comfortable in your uh, your aim language translation is very good and very nicely uh, uh, can be handled uh, the, the, the main point that you have made is that one needs to be fully aware of the cultural of the uh, of the, uh, of the literature that has been written and which is being translated I, I agree with you there, uh, but in spite of having that kind of say, you know, understanding of the local uh, culture and uh, is it not necessary to have sufficient skill? Sir, they know you are translating, you have translated Malayalam poetry. Is it not necessary to have sufficient skills in Malayalam uh, to go into the pulse of the, the poem and to effectively translate that into? Having the cultural background is one. No, no, it's, uh, it, yes, sufficient, it's, uh, sufficient skills are necessary. I don't say that I, I, I will be master of Malayalam, but I must know, I must understand, I must know how the language is treated. Yeah, that true. sufficient skills are necessary. But in source language, I need more than sufficient. If I am not a poet, I cannot translate poetry of Ayapapanikar into uh, into Hindi. You are talking about the target language. Target language. So, aim language or target language. But, if, uh, and for me, that story translation is difficult because I am not a story writer. So, in that, in your target language, you need more than sufficient uh, skill. But, in, in other languages, sufficient is, uh, sufficient knowledge. And, other than sufficient knowledge. We have we have faced you know very serious dearth of good translators. Uh, but when you look back at some of the major writers, uh, both of an earlier period as well as the contemporary writers, you find that some of them do their own translation. Uh, for instance, you know, uh, the most famous example is Stackwood himself. Whether uh, Kipanjali or some of the other books, but he translated it. And if the original writer is translated, sure, sure, those are not good translations. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we can read the original. No, of course, we can get into that for that presentation. But the point that I'm making is there are there are original poets and writers who have done their their own translations. Uh, among the contemporary writers, one could readily think of. Malayalam writers like you know, Mr. Pestananda, uh, Professor Ramakrishnan himself, and, and several others. Dilip Javeri, for example, who is sitting here, uh, who are exceptionally good 
in their own language, who haven't been exposed to books. And many of these books, they have been able to translate. And these are exceptionally good and authentic translations, which anyone would accept as an original book in itself. The same level of authenticity you may not get, the same level of credibility you may not get, somebody else is translating it. Because uh, the translator may or may not necessarily get into the pulse with which the particular work has been translated. How do you react to that? Okay. <coughs> no, I, I would like to just give you one example. A Stephen, Stephen Spender was uh, at Bharat Bhavan Bhopal 20 years ago. It's more than 20 years now. So uh, he, he, he was reading his poems and he showed us, you know, a poem. One of his poems translated into Tamil. He said, my original poem in English was four-line poem. And in Tamil it became 12 lines. I'm amazed. How does it happen? So what happens, you know? First it was translated. That four-line poem was translated into Bengali as six lines. From Bengali into Odia as eight lines. From Odia, it's east coast, you know, Odia to Malayalam uh, into eight lines. Then to Tamil, they get 12 lines. This is how it goes on. You know, if you don't have faithful translators, Stephen Spender will be talking like that. It was not a joke. He was saying what was happening in India. So we should be careful about that. We think that uh, translating from one language uh, is a very easy job. We should have very professional translators as we have in Europe. You just think about Lishman. Lishman was not a great dancer, a great poet. Uh, he sacrificed his poetic potential when he was translating Rainer Maria Rilke. So we should learn. We should learn. These, these models are there. We should learn. We don't give much importance to translations in India. Oh no, you know that, uh, that novels are translated in, the, in their own ways and uh, we don't have any question about that. But what about poetry? It's the most difficult part of translation is when you are working on a translated text. So that is the most important. You should sit with the poet. We should come together. We should know the nuances. We should know the differences. If we don't do that, do it. You know, it, it will be like uh, the example that I have given you. This is a terrible situation in India. It is happening everywhere. We don't give any patta to translation. That's the problem that we are facing. We should be serious about it. And what happens like this, you know, one magazine from Delhi asking me, please, Rubal, I want your poems in Hindi translation. Will you please send me four or five translations? What happens then to a poet? Or the next door man who knows Hindi? Maybe that man is a scholar in Hindi. Maybe a great professor in Hindi in Calcutta, but it doesn't mean that he will be able to translate a poem. That is a big question. A great professor may terribly fail in translation, but we all go to professors, uh, scholars. What is this? You go to a young poet who has the spirit of the language, ethos of the culture, and he can translate all the nuances of poems or poetry. This is where it is, you know, I think this is how India is going on. This is a terrible situation, I feel. This is my 25 years experience. I agree to both that, I mean, uh, just having, you know, very high skills in a language does not make a person a good translator. I, I do agree. Uh, one needs to understand the nuances of translation itself. Uh, I come back to the point that I was making for the yeah. that uh, uh, people who are translating themselves, they obviously are good in poetry or whatever else they are writing. And if they can translate the book, that would also be seen as an authentic book. Do you think uh, making a campaign of, let us say, write your own translation uh, could be some solution to this problem? Self-translation. Self -translation. Uh, I would like to make uh, react to the earlier point uh, uh, as well. See, in, when, you, when you talk of translation in India, there is uh, a certain kind of cultural baggage which yeah. comes from orientalist uh, phase onwards. You see, Charles Wilkins' translation of Bhagavad Gita in 1790s uh, onwards, uh, largely this uh, tradition of, uh, you see, uh, translating India 
has created a certain baggage, cultural baggage. India has been equated with uh, a classical India. Contemporary Indian poetry or contemporary Indian literature largely disappeared in the evaluation of Indian literature. And this situation continues even today. When Infosys, uh, Mr. Murthy gave a big endowment to, I think, Harvard for translating a project, they have again taken Max Muller's, uh, this entire Vedic, uh, music, classical literature for translation. That work is going on. A huge investment. But uh, in contemporary Indian uh, literature, there is a whole lot of lack of, uh, you say, translation and a, a kind of invisibility. And again, how do you address this issue? What happens is a whole lot of uh, inferior translations are flooding the market. Sahitya Academy itself is responsible for uh, a whole lot of inadequate, incompetent, unreadable kind of translation. How did Samskara become a classic? Because somebody like A.K. Ramanujan uh, invested time and out of uh, a major Indian text created an uh, English text which was highly readable, which was a, a imaginative you say, kind of translation. This kind of translation, that quality and rigor which you find in Akira Ramanujan is largely missing in most of the translation. A, a novel like Athaga, which is a challenging text, Gillian Wright, an Australian writer, has very adequately, competently translated Athaga with a whole lot of glossary and so we have examples. It takes uh, maybe 10 years, 12 years. Uh, we have Jayaratan's translation of uh, Premjan's uh, Godan, which wherever there's a difficult sentence, he will omit the entire paragraph. So the entire book becomes two-third or even one-third of the original. But you have an American writer translating it faithfully with a whole lot of investment. You have a new translation of Anandamant. The novel itself is 150 pages. Introduction is 100 pages. Again, by a foreign, you say, translation requires a whole lot of scholarship. These people fail to understand. You need a whole lot of other kind of dictionaries, not synonyms alone. There should be a Bankim Chandra Chatterjee dictionary. There should be a dictionary for uh, major writers. When Bashir was translated by a very effective translator, no less than Ari Asher, Edinburgh linguistic professor, the, the blurb actually called it Three Tales of Islamic Life in Kerala. I never knew there was Islamic life in Kerala. He never saw Bashir as a Muslim writer. He is the major Kerala Malayalam writer, maybe you say. And how do you frame a, a Malayalam writer suddenly as a Muslim writer? English tends to homogenize. English tends to also level a whole lot of things. And perhaps I have given this uh, a whole lot of such examples. Ovi Vijayana, the wonderful novel. Two communities in a you say, village, Rautar and, you see, when it is translated, he himself translated. He uses Muslims and Hindus. In Malayalam, they are not Muslims and Hindus. A, a whole lot of things in India are not really divisible in terms of community. There are, the identity is always blurred across several border lines. English tends to demarcate borders much more firmly. So translation very often creates images of community where there are no divisions. Sometimes it actually exists. And I do feel in there is a university in Istanbul, a translation studies department having 60 plus academies. In the entire India, you will not get 60 people in a translation department. You see, we, do, we are not taken translation uh, seriously. You look at journalism, 90% of the work is translation. What journalists do in media, it's, we have never taken translation studies as a major cultural studies area, film studies, theater studies. I think there is a lack of information.
information and lack of investment in this kind of thing. What he is saying that uh, the writers should come forward, forward for translation. The problem with us, again, the science academy and our academies, academic minds also, if you are famous, if you are popular with your, some, your translation, then they will not accept you as an original writer. That is a big challenge. Now, it happened to me because Ayapa Monica translation became so popular that when science academy has some program, Rati ji, when you have a translation, you will say, why not as a poet? So this is the problem. If you become popular as a translator, you cannot be a writer again in our academies and our place. That is the problem also. I think there is a very big issue, a very big theme of translation. I think from next time, you have a lot more time for this kind of But before we close, you are saying that it is here. I would just like to have, I would just like to have one or two comments in case somebody wants. I wanted to make a comment. Oh, may I? May I? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, that is with Daisy Rockwell, who is a superb translator from Hindi. Her painting exhibition is also outside. It is with Vidya Pai, who you all know is a translator from Kumpani. With Dr. Vrinda Nabar, who is also an eminent translator. And it's being led by Musharraf Faruqi, who is himself a superb, prodigious and prolific translator. That's at 2 of 5. And at 5.50, at 5.50 there is another conversation on translation. It's called Translation Dilemmas with Goa's own Augusto Pinto and Xavier Kota, with Nirja Mandu who translates from Kashmiri, with Mustanse Daldi who translates from Urdu as well as Marathi, and that will be led by Kiran Bhupal. Please, thank you so much for this wonderful panel. I know you've heard that you are wanting much, much more, and, and there are a lot more. I think next year we will have, uh, we will focus very, very strongly on translations. I see the need for it. That's what Goa is about. Yes, the literary festival on translation.